I remember pulling off of I-35 right there where South Park Meadows is. You guys ever been to South Park Meadows? It's this huge place with all kinds of um, stores and movie theaters and restaurants. The new, there was a newly built strip mall right across I-35 from uh, South Park Meadows and it didn't have any tenants in it, it was empty. There was one lonely little Domino's pizza at the end. And the rest of it was empty, and I kept thinking, man, I wonder if we could put a church there. I pulled into one of the many empty parking spots that were there and just sat for a while to pray. It was a beautiful spring day in 2010, 11 years ago, and I got out and kind of sat on the hood of my car and watched all the traffic whizzing by and all the shoppers across the street going into the, the different places and the stores, and I started to pray, God, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do here in this city? And I said, I'm here, I've followed you here, I felt like you directed me to come here, and this city is so big, tell me where to go. And as I was praying for a while, I, I felt this sense, this confirmation. I'd already thought about it, but it's like it settled in me. Uh, I felt God was whispering to me, below the river, west of 35. And then I was like, well, that's a pretty big area. <laughs> where, where do you want me to go? How do you want me to zero in on where we're gonna meet and how it's gonna work? And, I said, Lord, I'll plant a church anywhere you want me to go. I just don't want to be in a movie theater. <laughs> so we, we'd, we had started meeting in a launch team with about 60 or 70 people in the youth room over the gymnasium at Manshack Baptist Church out here on 1626. Uh, Larry Foster was the vice president of the deacon board and, uh, and he had, uh, we'd connected and he asked me if we needed a place to meet. I said yes and they let us meet there for free for several months and we were grateful because that room smelled. Um, <laughs> we didn't want to pay for it and so we, uh, we made it smell better and we did all kinds of stuff. But I remember there's a, there's a, you know, there's, there's, people are coming, they're checking out what this is, this dream of a church and what God had placed in our hearts. And we were looking for all kinds of places to meet, schools and different kinds of venues and auditoriums. We, we almost ended up at St. Edward's, St. Ed's. Spiro, Stavros, and I went and worked out the deal and at the last minute, they backed out and they're like, we're not ready for you. It's too much. <laughs> too crazy. Every weekend, we, we can't do it. I was desperate to find a place, and so I just didn't want to end up in a movie theater, so on September 12th, 2010, we started one chapel on Sundays in the movie theaters at Barton Creek Square Mall, right here. How many people came to church in that movie theater? Look at all those people. Come on, give them a huge hand. They're still here. The, um, it's funny, there's a, there's, a, there's a picture here that I want you to, that I want you to see. Here's launch, launch Sunday. This is all, this is all the people who were setting up, and I want, here's me, see me there? Look how skinny I am, oh. Here's Darren Green, some of you know Darren Green. Here's Carrie McDonald, here's Spiro Stavros. He had hair, it's awesome. Uh, <laughs> Here's Brent Parsley. He had a lot of hair. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, there's my beautiful wife. Look at her. Look at her, how sweet she looks. So awesome. And so all these people, all these people pulled together and started a dream. And that dream was that there would be a church that would care for people, that would love people, that would help introduce them to the love of God. 
It really doesn't seem that long ago, does it? Like 2010? Like, weirdly enough, they, like Iron Man 2 and Toy Story 3 were huge box office hits. Uh, the first iPad had just been introduced. Can you believe that? LeBron James had decided to take his talents to South Beach. And strangely enough, Sony was in the final year of producing the cassette Walkman. <laughs> like, that tells you how old that, how, how long ago that was. Like, that's weird. And those first five years at One Chapel were really exciting and very eventful. Lots of water baptisms, lots of people coming and getting a new lease on life, following Jesus. We, we grew very quickly, and I knew we were in trouble with the movie theater when the manager came to me and said, yeah, it feels kind of like a church that shows movies. It needs to feel more like a movie theater that has a church. That was his way of saying, you guys are taking over and I don't like it. <laughs> it, was, it was so weird because nobody was going to see movies. It was very strange. So I knew we had to move and we had to figure out where we were gonna go next and we were in four venues in our first four years. Think about that. We were in a movie theater, then we moved to a commercial office building, then we went to a high school for a year and then we went back to the commercial office building. That's like four moves. In 2015, we just were wrestling, God, what do you want us to do? Because the way we're doing this, we, we think there needs to be a greater emphasis on sending into our city. And so we um, followed God's prompting and started to become multi-locational to embrace the idea of sending and planting. We became a family of neighborhood churches overnight because we had planned to launch a Kyle campus and at the same time, another church had come to us because they were in trouble and had gone through some really hard times in, in Lake Travis, and they just came for advice, but at somewhere along the way, they said, you know, could we be part of this family of neighborhood churches that you're talking about? I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> we're not rehabbing churches, we're, we're planting new ones. <laughs> but the more, <laughs> the more we talked together, the more it seemed like the Holy Spirit was moving, and so, February of 2016, both of those churches became part of the family of neighborhood churches in the same month. So it was like having twins. <laughs> we were overwhelmed. We were uh, consumed with the collaborative challenges that were facing us, but we also learned that there was great joy in planting and sending. And so three years later in 2019, we launched our fourth campus at Liberty Hill because of something called Front Yard Friday. There was like 60 or 70 people meeting in somebody's front yard, Tawny and Tony DeYoung, and, and they were coming down to church 30 minutes from, well, 35, 40 minutes from there. Uh, and, 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 and so we, interestingly enough, there was a little empty 90-year-old Baptist church just there kind of dilapidated and needed some renovation, so we renovated it, and we started quickly into growth at Liberty Hill. And I want to say to you right now how proud I am of all of our campuses. Each campus has its own personality, and it is a lot like having kids. Like, like one chapel Kyle's a little bit like the younger brother, you know, <laughs> always trying to be obnoxious and, you know, tr tr trying to, you know, compete and but I'm so proud of David and Christina Campos, who are the campus pastors there. And they, they've done such a great job. But they've been, setting up for, they've been setting up at Evo for five and a half years. Setting up and tearing down. Um, they're tired, I'm just telling you. Lake Travis has this amazing nucleus and team that is poised for influence under Zach and Rachel Silver. I just see it. I see what the future is. Liberty Hill is a totally relational community that loves their city. And um, I'm, I'm so proud of you, Austin campus. I don't say it very much, but here's the truth. You planted these other three churches. You supported, you gave. It's your giving that made that possible. And now we're four churches that are really trying to figure out in this new 
culture we're living in, how we can move forward. And I'm so proud of you. A bunch of you are OGs, you're originals. And, and then some of you have joined with us from Austin Cathedral. And so there is, a, there is a new day that is kind of just just ahead of us. And we've been trying to figure out how to get this building finished. But it is close. It's looking good, isn't it? It's looking good. It's looking good. We got a few more things that we got to get done, but it's, it's looking good. This week, this week I've been promised, I'm putting it out there, putting pressure on them, the front, all the cedar beams are going in this week, which is super fun and super awesome. We tore down all the ropes this morning. Did you see it? Uh, you, did, you didn't even notice, did you? You're like, what ropes? You had a, well, when you drove in, there was ropes everywhere. It looked like some kind of trailer trash. Anyway, whatever. Um, we got, we got, sorry, no offense to those of you who live in trailers. Anyway, <laughs> today is Vision Sunday. Let's move on. And the reason for that is we need to be reminded of why we're here. We all need to be reminded of why we're here. We need to remember why we started the dream of a church that helps people move from where they are. <laughs> where God wants them to be. <laughs> Say it with a smile, it helps. Here's the truth. Here's the truth, One Chapel. Vision leaks. It leaks. If you don't keep filling up on vision, it goes away. Amen. It empties out. Other things start to crowd it out. Conveniences and distractions can cause vision itself to become weakened and small. Discouragements and challenges can overshadow vision, making it irrelevant. Proverbs 29, 18 says, where there is no revelation, people cast off restraint, but blessed is the one who heeds wisdom's instruction. What this verse means is without vision or without revelation, people do whatever they want. They cast off restraint, they wander, they wither, they waste their lives on meaningless pursuits. The message translation says it more plainly. Proverbs 29, 18 says, if people can't see what God is doing, they stumble all over themselves, but when they attend to what he reveals, they are most blessed. This morning, I want you to join me in attending to what God has revealed to us. I think it's easy to see that along the way and at different times, we've struggled to keep God's vision for one chapel alive and well in our hearts, but nothing could have prepared us for the challenges that we've been living through over the last 18 months. A worldwide pandemic, national arguments about all kinds of things, contentious politics, economic uncertainty. Man, we've been living through a very difficult season. And at one chapel, we've had our own internal struggles. A church is essentially a family. And so the church family has experienced a lot of the pain and isolation and struggle that your family has faced. We all had to figure out how to have church online. Do you remember that? Like that was a trip. We really stunk at it at first. We, all, we, we had church outside at every campus for three months. Do you remember that? That was so much fun. I think we should do it again from time to time. But here's, no, and some, all the team's like, no, no, no. Listen, it, listen it, was so, it was so funny. This is crazy. We went three months, not one rain Sunday. That was amazing. But we had our own, you know, over the last many months and the last year, we've had our own attrition and isolation. The national statistics from Barna and Pew Research essentially say that churches are about 60 to 70% nationwide of their pre-pandemic numbers. That's a na those are national statistics. What they say is ten, about 10 to 20% remain online and about 20 to 25% have simply disappeared. 
they left. Church wasn't important enough for them to stay. Our numbers line up with that. Our numbers, our numbers line up with that at every campus. But we've also had a couple of major departures. Like, we've only had two, listen to this, we've only had two, over 11 years, we've only had two huge campus pastor transitional uh, moments at one chapel. Unfortunately, they've both come in the last year at Liberty Hill and Lake Travis while we were wrestling through the pandemic. We've been working really diligently, consistently to rebuild and restart both of those campuses and they are doing well. And I'm excited about what's next for all of our campuses. I'm trying to turn our attention to what is ahead for us as a church. And I'm gonna break a little bit of news to you today because one of the decisions that our leadership team has made after lots of prayer and lots of wrestling is we're going to um, we're going to integrate the Sunday experience for Austin and Kyle. So next month, Kyle's going to begin joining us for Sundays, which is pretty fun. So th so so what what I love about Kyle is they got attitude. So you're going to have to up your game. But it is gonna be fun. And, and the, one of the reasons we're doing it, that is there's some financial reasons, there are um, team one reasons, there are other reasons to consolidate and get us as a church, as four churches we've kind of expanded and we are wrestling with being diluted with team members. And I don't know if you've heard it, but recruitment has been strong over the last few months. <laughs> and yet it hasn't really worked um, as well as it probably should. But I believe that we'll save some money, we'll, we'll, we'll consolidate on Sundays. Now, Kyle will continue to keep its identity as a community. They will do everything as normal, have groups every week. They'll do uh, student ministries on Wednesday nights. They will continue to do Front Yard Fridays and other gatherings as a community, but they will come and join us together on Sundays for um, at least the next year. And the, po the possibility is it exists of them um, you know, going back and, and doing Sundays, but we just feel like where we are as a church, we need, to, we need to pull together. We need each other now more than ever before, and now we, we need to get stronger so that we can influence the world around us, and that's why we're doing this. Now, some of you are watching uh, online right now on the live stream, and you're from the Kyle campus, and you're like, well, nobody told me. Well, the, the, leader, the leaders have been on a, on a steady journey uh, of talking about it over the last six to eight weeks, and today there's a family meeting right after church, and so you still have time, if you're from Kyle, to go to the family meeting, all right? Get in the car and go down there. Uh, they'll have it at Evo, all right? So here's what I believe, church. God is repositioning us. He's repositioning us and restoring our purpose, our original purpose, He's reminding us of why we're here. I believe God is redirecting us with new strategies for the next season. I don't know if you realize it, but things are moving pretty fast in our culture. And we have to catch up. I have a conviction that God is resetting our vision and mission and we're looking towards the future. Here's my point, we all need a fresh infusion of vision. Because you see, our vision and our values really are not gonna change, right? They're gonna remain the same. The vision and values have not changed. We're gonna keep helping people move toward Jesus, whether that means the oldest Christian in the room or a brand new baby Christian who's still trying to figure out if Jesus is who he says he is. We're gonna help move people towards Jesus. People get stuck in their lives. Listen, a bunch of you have gotten stuck over the last 18 months. You've gotten stuck. I want to help get people unstuck. Because you understand, you understand when people stop moving, right, physically. When you stop moving physically, what happens to you? You get weak. Not only do you get weak, but you lose your motivation. You get lazy. That's what happens. Well, I know that from experience. When I, when, I, when I don't work out, I start getting weak, but then I start not wanting to work out. Same thing happens spiritually. 
It's exactly the same spiritually. If you don't move, if you don't activate yourself, if you don't connect in a group, if you don't belong on a team, if you don't find your way to moving, you will become weak spiritually. And finally, you'll lose your motivation. We're gonna keep embracing the same three values we've had since our beginning, presence, relationship, and mission. Listen, I believe strongly in the presence of God as a transforming agent to see people's lives totally changed. I think encounters with the Holy Spirit is what we need more of. And I think we need that on Sunday mornings, we need that in retreats, we need that in uh, coffee shops over a table where you're talking about really deep and meaningful things. We need more encounters with the Holy Spirit. The presence of God, here's what we believe about God's presence. We believe that God is present and active among us. Amen. Now listen, now listen, some of you don't get this. If you believe that God is present and active in your life, you act different. You think different. If you believe God is present and active at your workplace, guess what? You see it differently. You see the people around you differently. Your idiot boss is no longer just your idiot boss. He's a guy who needs prayer. He's a guy who needs your kindness. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> idiot boss, I'm really free today. We have to renew our commitment to the presence of God being the driving force, the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Relationship is the second value. We've just been saying it since the beginning. It means loving people well and practicing our faith in community. Christianity cannot be practiced as an individualized or isolated spirituality. People all over Austin, it's a kind of a, a spiritual city, right? You've ever heard people say it. You know, I'm not very religious, but I'm deeply spiritual. Yeah, that's code for I just want to do it myself. I always say everybody loves God, it just they also hate his family. Everybody loves God, they just don't like his family because his family is messed up. Can I get an amen? Yeah, look at your neighbor and say, you're messed up. This is, this, we, we're all in process, we're all, we're all on this journey, but there is no other way. Listen, here, now listen to me. You can get an encounter with God and have a moment where God touches you and changes your life, but walking out that change, that encounter is only a decision. It's a moment. Relationships are how you walk it out and really become changed. It's how you walk out the change. It's how you walk out what God has said to you and what he's done in your life. Every one of us need community. Every one of us have to have meaningful relationships, places where we're known, truly known, and truly loved anyway. Right? Because once somebody truly knows you, <laughs> truly known and truly loved anyway. The third I value is mission. Mission is the, the reason we exist as a church. Like, like our relationship with God needs to overflow into others who don't know him. Mission is living out the gospel, the good news by serving, by mentoring, and sharing Jesus with others. The, but listen, the mission has to be practical, whether it's a paper drive at an elementary school, which we did a couple years ago, how does a ream of paper become the love of Jesus? Only God can do that. Helping an older lady fix her house or maybe becoming a foster family, like the mission has to be super practical. And we, we need to get back to our roots of proactive outreach and getting our hands dirty. That's what we need more of at One Chapel. Ultimately, making disciples and helping each other practice the ways of Jesus is why we're here. It's the only thing, making disciples and practicing the ways of Jesus, the only thing that really defines our success. We can have lots of people who show up on Sunday, but if we're not making other disciples who we're, we're walking with and we're not practicing the ways of Jesus together, we're isolated, it doesn't matter, it's, that's not success. 
The last few words of Jesus to his disciples must ring in our hearts and live in our lives. Matthew 28, 18 through 20 says, then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. It's been feeling a lot like we're getting to the very end of the age, hasn't it? You gotta believe that Jesus is with you. Listen, my hope for one chapel, here's what I really hope for, and I've talked about this since we started, is that every person will believe and act on the idea that they can be a disciple of Jesus. They can follow him closely, and they can help someone else follow him closely. If every one of you believe that that's what's possible, everything changes. You believe you can, dis some of you are like, oh, a disciple, that sounds really serious. Isn't that for like the serious people? Isn't that only for the deep teaching people? No, actually, it's every one of us. Follow Jesus closely and help others follow Jesus closely. And you gotta do it practically. We gotta do it with one another. Wherever you're going, Jesus says, he said to all the nations, and he said, go. And when you unpack that, the way that, that phrase, go into all the world, it's, it is this idea that wherever you find yourself, make disciples. Wherever you're go, going, as you're going, help people encounter Jesus with his presence and power, baptizing them in the threefold family name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Introduce them to him. Pray and, uh, and, and, and embrace them in community. Teach them how to obey the scriptures. That's where all the work is. Teaching each other how to obey. Jesus will be right there with you the whole time. But listen, it has to be concrete. We have to take steps to do this. I want you to start by downloading the Bless Every Home app. Does anybody remember someone talking about that over the last few weeks? Yeah, yeah. Bless Every Home app. This is a city-wide effort for churches all over the city to download this app and pray for their neighbors. You can download the app at onechapel.com. You can check it out on your QR code right there, little scan, you can find it there and it's easy to sign up. I want you to begin to pray for your neighbors. I want you to begin to go back to your roots. When you're a church plant and you don't have anybody who comes to your church, you pray a lot. I think a church grows in prayer before they grow in numbers. We got some work we need to do in prayer. And I want you to think about when you pray, I want you to ask God to, show you who you should invite to church. What? Me invite somebody to church? I don't know. That's something every one of us can do and should do, including me. I'm preaching to myself today. During a pandemic, it's not like you wanna, people wanna come to where the crowds are. But we need to get back to this kind of thought process. Two out of 52, everybody say it with me. Two out of 52, that's two Sundays out of the 52 that, hap come, that happen every year, that come every year. Two out of 52, you ought to invite somebody to church. It could be Easter Sunday, it could be Christmas Eve services, it could be in any number of things, but listen, 50 Sundays a year, you could come to church, worship God, have a great time, meet all your friends, but two Sundays a year, you need to go through the nervous anxiety and adventure that is a new person sitting right beside you. Because you're gonna sit there, you're gonna be more invested in that service than any other service you've ever been to. Oh Jesus, please help Pastor Ross not to screw it up. Oh, I hope they don't sing that really weird song. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's, like, it's like this is the thing. Like, we got to get back to this. We can't stay isolated in our little bubbles. You know, Jesus did all kinds of things. He never, he never allowed his own bubble or other people's bubble to stay. He always punctured those bubbles. He touched the leper. He talked to the woman who was ashamed. He invaded the space 
for the sake of the kingdom. We got work to do to do that in a way like Jesus did it. I don't need any evangelism linebackers. You guys ever seen the evangelism linebacker? It's a pretty funny video. It's this guy who tells people about Jesus, but the only way he does it is by tackling them. <laughs> we don't need evangelism linebackers. We need people who pray and are sensitive and listening and walking through life aware that other people need Jesus and ready. This fall we're hosting several what we're calling bridge events. Everybody say bridge events. A bridge events is this, we're in a culture right now where Christians have really become more isolated and there's all these other people and there's a chasm in between us. And we gotta build a bridge. So we're gonna create some bridge events. We're gonna do, the marriage and parenting seminar is a bridge event. We're gonna talk about having a better marriage and trying to deal with your unruly kids. Anybody can come to that. It's gonna be, it's, uh, Joe McGee is hilarious. I'm telling you, it's gonna be fun. We're gonna do a trunk or treat and a movie night on the campus here on October 29th, right before Halloween. We're gonna do feature presentations in November. That's our movie series where we take stories from our culture and then we un unpack the biblical truths that are in those stories. It is an opportunity for people who really don't know anything about church to come and like, oh, this is not as weird as I thought. And I know sometimes there's people who say, oh, we're just, we're, we're watching movies in church. That doesn't seem very spiritual. <laughs> Listen, let me tell you, let me tell you this. Coming to church is like going to the swimming pool. Sometimes we're gonna be in the deep end and sometimes we're gonna be in the shallow end. Every Sunday will not be in the deep end. And hopefully every Sunday will not be in the shallow end. But we gotta remember that the goal of church life is to help people who are just getting in the water learn how to swim. And they don't learn how to swim on Sunday morning. They learn how to swim in your small group. They learn how to swim when somebody's holding their hand and walking with them. They learn how to swim when they're in community and connected. There's a Christmas Eve service at the end of the year. Listen, the Christmas Eve is such a great time to invite people to church because everybody loves baby Jesus. <laughs> Easter's like all about bloody Jesus, but, but Christmas is about baby Jesus, and everybody's like, oh, it's so sweet, what a great story. <laughs> Greatest story ever told. <laughs> Remember that church isn't always for you. Remember that church isn't always for you. And the longer you're here, the more that has to get inside you because somebody else has a great need around you. And so we, we gotta embrace that. We gotta get back to that mindset. We gotta stop critiquing every message through the lens of our politics and our cultural conversation. Like, listen, listen, listen people. 10% of what every pastor says on a stage just needs to be thrown out. Like, just give, just give him that. You know, like, give it, like, give him 10% that he said it wrong and he did it wrong or he said, he didn't, give, just 10%, oh, it's all right. But instead, everybody is hypersensitive to everything that is said. We gotta stop that. That's not healthy. It's not a healthy way to be in community. For us to move forward as a church family, consumer Christianity is not going to cut it. We're gonna need to look beyond ourselves. We'll need to look to our neighbors and pray over them. We'll need to really be intentional about what God is asking us to do. To become who God is asking us to be in 2021, a convenience mindset is not going to work. If it's all about your convenience, you're not gonna make it. And that's what we're fed every week. Like, we're gonna have to resist the urge to isolate and pull back. We're gonna have to take the form of a servant like Jesus and lean in. We come to church to help each other, take care of each other, serve one another. We're gonna need the empowerment of the Holy Spirit to move with purpose, to belong to a group and to engage 
with the world around us. Our values haven't changed, our vision hasn't changed, but here's what may need to change are the vehicles that we're gonna use to deliver God's love and grace to a world that needs healing and hope. We may have to evaluate our vehicles. I don't know if you've noticed, but culture is changing so rapidly, we're having to figure it out. I don't know if 10 churches in 10 campuses in 10 years is still viable. I don't know. But I'm willing to be open-handed, and I want our vision and our values to be unchanged. But I, I think we might have to find better ways to plant churches and to influence neighbors. We might have to find uh, more personal ways to meet people's needs right where they're at individually. Perhaps we'll need to be more focused on good deeds and meeting needs. I think that's probably true. This is what Jesus talked about in Matthew 5.14. He said, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. That's a good word. We've been a little too afraid to let light shine. This is why we're building a house for a homeless person or, or, or family at Community First Village. You know, you and I are doing this together. You gave towards this last year, and it's gonna be finished in February or March. We're gonna go down there, we're gonna have uh, some celebration as, as it gets to the, near the end. We're gonna be more connected to Community First Village as a church. We're gonna engage with volunteerism and serving. Later this year, we're gonna host a worship night on the property there at Community First Village. We're gonna be more active with, <sighs> people like Habitat for Humanity, and you understand these are practical problems that our whole city sees every day as they're driving around our city. Practical homeless problems. We need to be part of the solution, and we need to give our energy and effort in a practical way. And that's what we're gonna do. We're gonna be more active with missions work in Mexico and in other needy places. We have a trip on Thanksgiving week for 15 people to go and build some ho a home in, uh, in Mexico. And, and so I, I really encourage you, you can talk to Pastor Lori Catone about that. We're planning some other trips to the Dominican Republic, maybe to the Middle East next year. I mean, there are some really important things that we are gonna do together on mission, locally and globally. And as you know, Catalyst is back, you know, be a disciple, make a disciple is the tagline. I think catalyst is really important. I want you to remember, I want you to remember, Austin, that Jesus said, I will build my church. He didn't say, I'll build Ross's church or I'll build one chapel. Jesus said, I'll build my church Amen. and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. <laughs> so the question is, so the question is, are we gonna be Jesus' church? Yes, are we gonna be Jesus' church? He's in charge, I trust him. Our church is not a random collection of people who have religious obligations, no. This is not just a self-help center to improve how we feel about ourselves. We are not a fundraising organization. I wanna remind you that we are a supernatural, Christ-centered community who are part of a worldwide movement of miracles and healing and hope that are going into the world. We have a kingdom purpose and our kingdom purpose is bringing heaven to earth. We don't have to give in to where we've been the last year and a half, we can move forward. Amen. We don't have to let the negativity that's been burdening us over the last few years to define us. I want you to know that I believe that the hope of the world lives inside of our hearts. And we have to believe this. This is who we are. We gotta renew our vision for the future. We gotta reorient our hearts for what God is doing now. We must relive and reimagine and reorient ourselves to see what God is doing in our time. Amen. I'm excited about what God's gonna do next uh, at One Chapel. I believe the future's bright, but people, I don't wanna go by myself. I want you to go with me. Amen. Will you go with me? Yes. 
I don't have enough time left to do the last part of my message, but I'm gonna speed through it. Can you give me five minutes? There's five things that we've done since the beginning, and I want to remind you of the five things. At the end of the day, this is all we do at One Chapel, these five things, okay? Everybody, put your hand up, five things. Okay, put it down, here it is. Five things that we do. Number one, we worship. We gather each weekend for scripture, encouragement, encounters, and vision. That's what we do, we gather. Did you know that the average person is now going to church about once a month? Most of you are not average. But the average person is barely going to a place where they come together with this other, these other people and they worship God and have an encounter with God and, and have vision in scripture. Hebrews 10, 24 says, do not let us give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Let's worship together. Number two, we belong. That's what we do, we belong. We gather in groups every week for spiritual growth, emotional health, and strength in community. Like every person needs to be part of a small group. Every single one of you need to be a part of a place where you're really known and loved. If you're not, it's gonna be really hard for you to grow in Jesus. You gotta belong somewhere. First John 4, 12 says, no one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us. In other words, he says, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. What that means is, the way we see God, the way he is revealed to us, is usually with other people. Through other people. No one's ever seen God. But if we live in love, God lives in us. This is how it works. Number three, we serve. Five things we do, we worship, we belong, we serve. We gather on teams to make one chapel a healthy church. Everybody say healthy church. A healthy church where needs are met and community is served. Every one of us can be more like Jesus when we decide to serve someone in need. Jesus was the greatest servant. He said in Matthew 20, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Greatness in the kingdom of God is defined by serving. It's really the first step in discipleship and following Jesus. Number four is give. Everybody say give. We gather our resources to form a generous culture for church strength, church planting, missions, and benevolence. Your giving matters, it's huge. Every one of us can become a percentage giver. Everybody say percentage giver. Some of you are like, what is that? Percentage, yes, what it means is you give a percentage of what you have and you give it consistently. That's how the Bible describes what we should do. And what I believe is God wants to make you a progressive giver. Because the more you give, he provides he keeps giving to you and your percentage goes up because you have plenty. That's what ver the verse says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7. It says, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion from the grumpy pastor, for God loves a cheerful giver, a cheerful giver, and God is able, look at this, to bless you abundantly so that in all things, at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. Now listen. Some of you have forgotten that that actually is scripture because you've been through a really hard time. I, I get that. I've experienced it this, over this last 18 months. Put your faith around what God has said and believe that he is your provider. Number five is grow. We gather to provide, prioritize spiritual formation. In other words, growth with the conviction that every Christian is a disciple who makes a disciple. Ephesians 4.15, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Now, put your, put your hand up again, okay? What's the first one? Worship? worship? Worship, do it with me, worship? Okay, don't do your thumb, do it like I'm telling you to do it. <laughs> so. Worship, belong, serve, give, and wait, wait, wait for it. Do it. It's called opposable thumbs. And what it means is the way you grow is you do it all. Gro when you do these four things, growth starts to become the byproduct. Growth touches when you decide to serve, you grow. When you decide to give, you grow. When you decide to belong, 
you grow. When you decide you're gonna worship with the people of God, you grow. I want you to understand that I want you to do all five of these things. Every person, if every person does all five of these things, we become a powerhouse of a church that's gonna reach the world. Now I get it, I get it, I get it. More people come on Sunday, they come, they do number one more than they do number three. There's only a small group of people that serve and a bigger group of people that show up on Sundays. I don't think that's how it's supposed to be, but that is how it's always been. I understand that, but here's what I want you to do. Just try, instead of only doing one thing, do two. (laughs) Do two of them. Get involved in a group or get involved in a team or do something or maybe give for the first time like, like really like okay I'm going to get like do two and then do three. Instead of just worshiping on Sundays be part of a group and maybe sometime down the road be part of a team or you can rotate and make the church healthy because not 20% are not doing 80% of the work. I'm just telling you when we do these five things we become the healthiest, most powerful, most aggressive church that we can be. Okay? Close your eyes and let's pray. I want to lead you in a prayer and I just want to lead you in a prayer, very simple, very innocent. God, what do you want me to do? God, will you direct each of our steps? Will you direct each of our hearts? Will you direct each of our lives? Would you redirect us because we've kind of gotten off course? Lord, would you help us, each person in this room, to decide to take the journey, to take the journey of these five things, maybe just increasing to one or two more. Would you show us how to be trusting Show us how to trust you. Show us how to be faithful. Show us how to be together (laughs) in a community. Show us how to become the church you've called us to be. Not, Not the church we've been in the past, even though there's some really good things about that. We want to be the church that you're moving us into the future. And I pray for every person, every heart in this room, even, the, even some of the people who are here and just still kind of investigating the claims of Jesus or still trying to figure out if they can belong to this family. Father, I pray that you would bring your spirit, your life, your heart, your words, your, your whisper to bear on each of us and help us to move from where we are to where you want us to be. We thank you for this. In Jesus' name, we say yes. We say yes. We say yes to you, God. Lead us, guide us. Challenge us. Help us to be open to your spirit. Open to new things. Open to catalyst. Open to a small group. Open to leading. Open to serving. Open to what you're calling us to do. We thank you for this, in Jesus' name, amen.